Welcome to the next podcast from Mel and Reinfo. I'm your host, Lauren Ritchie. Thank you so much for joining me today for this episode with Vis Mordet of Le Plus Belle. Vis is a couture milliner based in the Netherlands who returned to her home country after working in Paris for over 20 years. She joins us with some of those tales today. Thank you to our wonderful podcast sponsors for making this episode possible. Hats by Lico, Hat Academy, Best Western Apollo Bay Motel and Apartments, Louise McDonald Milliner, House for Dawn, Hatter's Millinery Supplies, Lifted Millinery, Be Unique Millinery, Judith M. Millinery Supply House, Hat Mags, and Millinery Australia. You can find a link to each of these businesses in our show notes. That's either in your podcast app or through our website. If you have been enjoying listening to this podcast series, I would like to invite you to show your support through becoming a Patreon. We are so grateful to our podcast sponsors, but we also have two other tiers available where you can show your support and say thank you for the inspiration or business support you might have received through listening to this podcast. If you head over to www.patreon.com forward slash millinery info, you can find out more about it. Thank you for joining me today and I hope you enjoy this episode of Peace. going to start by welcoming you and thanking you so much for being part of this podcast. It's wonderful to be talking hats with you. And we're going to jump back to the beginning of how did you first begin hat making? Well, when I was at um, grammar school, when I was like many uh, youngsters, I didn't know what to do. I wanted to do something. Uh, I, I liked drawing and I wanted to do something creative, but I didn't know what and I was quite at a loss. And I had uh, a gap year, which I spent mainly in, in London, patching up my English a bit. And um, we didn't have the internet at the time. Uh, so I asked my mother if she could find information for me about uh, art schools, fashion schools. I didn't know, I was some, somewhere in between art school, fashion school, theater, I didn't know exactly what. And I ended up going to uh, the Fashion Academy in, in Amsterdam. And uh, it was quite uh, a revelation because in the first year we did a lot of drawing and, and also sculpting and things that were never considered very important when I was at school because it was more about the intellectual side. And of course, this is what I liked. And uh, there were two sections you, you could choose for uh, haute couture or ready to wear. And I chose couture and there were millinery lessons in there. And um, my mother wore hats maybe when I was very young. I remember going to a hat shop with her when I was quite small, but later in the 60s, it was outdated. And so there weren't much hats around anymore. But I loved the hats because of their sculptural element. And I had a very good teacher. Uh, her name is Elisabeth van der Helm. And she had, she had been to art school. She, was, she had a very creative approach. And um, I made my first hats there and I, I loved it. Also, it, the, the result was quicker than when you make uh, garments. When you uh, when you when you make clothing, you have to to do the draping, and then you make the pattern, and then you have to cut the dress, and then you have to sew it. So, with the hat, you are working in in three dimensions directly, and you see the the result of what you're doing much quicker. So, I, I love that. And um, after um, fashion school in Amsterdam, I wanted to go uh, abroad. Well, I had been to England. I wanted to go to France. Um, my French wasn't very good but good enough I think to cope so I enrolled in a fashion school in uh, Paris and I didn't like it at all because it was much more um, disciplined like what I was used to and I was not uh, a teenager anymore I was uh, in my early 20s and uh, I felt as if I was back to primary school so that <laughs> was a very different style of teaching <laughs> but I wanted to stay in Paris so I had to announce to my parents that I wanted to drop out there which of course they didn't like uh, I said I have to find another occupation or to 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 be able to stay here and so I I, I took out the 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 address book of of uh, you know it was called something like the, the the golden dictionary where you could find the names of all businesses and I started to look uh, where I could find head businesses but I didn't know anything about it uh, so I ended up in the fourth district with a, a, a small workroom where they made uh, caps, men's caps. And that was not at all what I meant. Uh, so I realized I, was, I wasn't in the right district. And uh, Paris is very organized, which is nice for a person like me who has no sense of direction. So I said to myself, well, <laughs> this is the district of the, the smaller artisan 
artisans. It has changed now, but that, that, that was in the 80s. It was still that way. I have to go to the luxury districts, which is the 8th eight, or the 16th. So I looked in the directory again. That is where the couture houses are. So I thought, well, that's where I have to go. And I found another address, and that turned out to be uh, Jean Barthé, the, the house where I work, consequently. Uh, so I was very, very nervous because I'm a, a rather a shy person. But I knew that if I wanted to stay in Paris, I had to have a reason to stay there. So I, I went there and I presented myself and I asked if I could uh, come and, and, and do an internship or work there. And they were working, uh, Jean Barthé was a very chaotic person, and they were working um, on an exhibition that had nothing to do with hats, but it was it was a commercial operation for a, a, a brand of a paper, toilet paper, and <laughs> tissues and things like that. And they had those tissues in soft pastel colors at the time. You know, it used to be white, and then they they brought uh, pink and green and yellow and, 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 and soft blue on the market. My well, Jean Barthet had made uh, sculptures out of that, animals, trees, things, and it had been an exhibition, and it was going to travel to Russia. I don't know why. And they needed help to, to, to finish the thing because everything had to be re, remade, of course, because paper is not, well, it, it hadn't, uh, it had to be re reworked. So uh, never mind what I wanted, pair of hands, okay, you can come in. And I said, okay, I'm going to do that. And then afterwards, can I come in the workroom? I said, okay, okay, okay. Not paid, nothing else. So I made um, animals and, and plants from tissue paper and some some of the people went to Russia of course I didn't go because I, I was new there but once that was over that was just for I don't know a week or so I worked in the workroom there and um, I didn't say too much about that I had already learned a bit, little bit to make hats I, I, I kept a sort of low pro profile because I was not French I was new and, so. and um, it was great it was uh, something out of the 19th century uh, you know with quite small uh, wooden tables with chairs that didn't match, not enough space. People who, who had walked away, walked away from a story. It was something completely new for me. It was also the, the language. Of course, I had learned French in school, but this was not school French. So it was adapting, adapting, adapting. And then after a couple of months, of course, I had to ask to get paid because I couldn't stay on there not being paid. And uh, I knew that uh, my work was getting better and uh, the head milliner was um, quite happy with me. So uh, well, I, I, I went into the office and I said, I really wanted to get paid. And, well, that was a problem because there never was any money. So I really had to insist and said that, well, otherwise I couldn't stay on and they had uh, milliner put in a good work for me. I was quite nervous, but in the end they paid me a, a small salary. And, uh, I became part of the thing and I, I decided to pass my uh, milliner's diploma. That was a, a CAP, that's a Certificat d'Aptitude Professionnelle. It's a professional um, sort of middle level diploma. That's the only thing there is in, in milliner in France. Uh, I did that on the side and I learned from the ladies there and it was small and chaotic, which meant that I got to do about everything. If it's a very large organized house, you only get to do the task you paid for. But if it's small and, and not very well organized, you have, you have to, to do everything. And that was a great learning school. We worked very hard. It was great fun. There were always, always lots of interns around because they never had enough money for, for enough staff. <laughs> yes. But we did the collections of the fashion houses that didn't have their own millinery workrooms anymore. Because in the past, of course, fashion houses had different workrooms. They had their uh, garment workrooms and then they had fur and they had uh, hats and other accessories and all this uh, slowly started to to well they they, they closed down the, the less essential workshops so we did collections for a lot of houses as well in couture as in uh, ready to wear so it was collection time four times a year and it was really crazy yeah. because we had to do a lot in uh, not enough time so we worked evenings we even worked weekends not really got paid for it or sometimes food was always a problem because uh, I didn't have the money to go to a restaurant so we depended on, on food being served and it was always late and uh, I remember going to the to the office and saying we really want to eat now and uh, so I learned <laughs> to stand up for myself and I even became member of a union no that was later I think but I, 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 I went to find out and uh, we were not at all a union family at home my 
father saw red in the face when we talked about him. So I wasn't used to that. So it was quite an education, but I, I had to stand up for myself. Often we didn't get paid at the end of the month because there wasn't money. So we had to wait for, for the beginning of the next month. But of course, you couldn't wait with your, uh, for your rent and things. So it was chaotic. It was fun. It was tiring. It was, it was great. And the people were great. And now I write stories about it. And it seems so long ago now. But in, in France, France change, things don't change uh, quickly. Uh, I think it's very conservative society. So when I go back there, I immediately feel at home because discussions are still the same. Topics are still the same. <laughs> because those were the years of uh, François Mitterrand. Uh, there was a lot of political movement. After five years, I decided that it was enough that if I stayed on any longer, it would impact my health because those long working hours when you bend over, uh, often collection hats are huge hats. So you, yes. you, know, you, you didn't have enough space. I, I, I started to feel it in my, my shoulders and my neck. So it was time to look for another job. And there were different uh, career options. It was either the theater. There are two uh, very well financed big cultural institutions, that's the opera and the Comédie Française. The Comédie Française is the National Theatre and uh, they are both um, very important for French culture, so they are heavily subsidized. And then of course there are the couture houses. So I thought to myself, I had heard that there was a possibility of entering at the Comédie Française if they were looking for someone. And um, I thought, well, I'm going to do a couple of years in the theatre and then I can switch to a couture house and then I will have done uh, di different, uh, different things. Uh, so the first time I went to the, to the theatre, I met the head milliner there and she was going to retire a couple of years later. Uh, but she said, we have no, no space now, but she came from Jean Bartet, so she was uh, yeah. confident that I would have the skills. So she said, well, you just keep look out. Uh, there may be an opportunity a bit later and then a couple of years no a couple of months later I don't know exactly but later I returned there but it had to be hush hush because Barthé didn't like you to leave he felt betrayed he was very emotional about things uh, so I had to do that I sneaked out during lunch hour there were no phone, um, uh, smartphones of course so I went to a cabin to telephone in secret to to see if I could get an appointment <laughs> and it was only until I was sure that I had a job there that I announced it to my boss but as it was theatre and it was not a competitor he was uh, okay about it because I'd <laughs> sworn to myself that I was not going to leave with uh, tantrums and tears as I'd seen happening sometimes so I left there <laughs> in a nice way and uh, I started to work in theatre where I was oh, paid man. even less than a child <laughs> because it was a very strict system that has changed now, but uh, where you were promoted by little steps all over your career, which meant that people stayed for a very, very long time. It wasn't very dynamic, but uh, so I said, okay, I'll start with that salary, but uh, after a year, if it doesn't change, I'm going away. So I knew that I had to find something else because if you say that you're going to go away, you, 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 you need to. to have backup, <laughs> otherwise you can't. So I had stayed in touch with uh, the lady who, a lady who worked at Nina Ricci, I think she was at Milena there. I knew that at the end of the year, I could maybe switch to her. So I went back to see the, the head of, of, of staff and I said, well, now I'd like to, <laughs> to be promoted a little bit, otherwise I'm going away. That works. And I stayed there for 19 years because after a couple of years, I realized that the workshops in the couture houses were all closing down. All the friends I had that were working there were doing different things. So I looked at, well, the better side of it is that, well, here I have regular working hours. I get paid regularly. And uh, if I switch to a couture house now, maybe in two or three years time, I will find myself without employment. And so that's why I stayed on there. And it was different, of course, the, the, the standards of work were just as high. Uh, because all the workrooms are uh, in-house, so, so it's, the staff is very, very capable. Only the position of the, of the, the hat is different because it, it's just part of a costume and the costume is to help the actor step into his role. It's not the star of the runway. So you have to be uh, very much aware of the comfort of, of, of the actors. The, 
the things they need to 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 be able to play and of course the the hats are used very intensively it uh, plays in a, at the national theater they, they play every night so uh, costumes are uh, worn and actors are very, very uh, physically very active on stage so you get sweat and 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 uh, wear and tear so it's a different way of constructing and you have to take care of the of the things afterwards and wear them and uh, or if there are changes in uh, in the in the rules you have to redo them so it's a different way of working uh, but it was uh, definitely interesting and I started to, to to want to read the plays that we were working for. And which is strange is that, I don't know if it's the same thing everywhere, but a rather strict hierarchy, it's, it's uh, the French society is class conscious. So the, the people in the workroom, so sometimes I ask girls who made the dresses, so who, who, am, I, who am I working for? Well, this is this, just for which actress is it? And she said, uh, oh, it's for Donna. And what's she playing then? So, oh, well, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know. I said, that's weird. You're making those beautiful things and you don't even know the role it's going to play. So I said, don't you read the, the plays that? No, 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 we never get that. And um, the, the texts were uh, printed for everybody who was concerned with the play, the, the actors, but also technical staff, and given to them to, to read, but not to the workrooms. So I asked for us to get the text, and that was very difficult because it never been done before. So I started to, to, to buy the, the texts. Uh, they had a, a bookshop and to read the plays because it's ridiculous if you don't know what you're doing. And uh, the intellectual side of it, of course, is interesting because the costume also has to tell something. It helps to, to give a certain interpretation because each, each um, director wants to put something of himself in the play. If you're playing Moliere or, well, let's, let's compare it to Shakespeare. You don't want to do the same Shakespeare as everybody else. You want to do the same play, but differently or give it uh, uh, some connection with uh, um, modern life or whatever. So every director dresses something or, or puts another light on it. And that's what you do when you make costume. You, you, you can help uh, bring that uh, on stage. That's what asks of you. It's not just to look at the drawing and, 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 and make the thing. That's the interesting side of it. So I think if you if you keep that separated, if you separate people into just dumb workers and the other ones are doing the intellectual side, that's not working. So that was a nice thing for me at the theater. And of course, you get to work with different um, costume designers every time. Some of them very good, others not so good. But each time you have to, to work as a team with all the other workrooms and get something on stage that's just right. And that's the challenge. So the challenges are different. Mm -hmm you find the solutions. So it was very interesting. Sorry, I think I asked a lot more than just your first question. <laughs> no, that's all that. wonderful. <laughs> I was going to ask you, um, in when you were working with the theatre um, company, were you just constructing or were you also sourcing and finding those supplies to make the pieces as well? Uh, finding the supplies, certainly, yes. Uh, it, it, it depended a lot on the, the, the designer. Um, usually the, there was a design team, so a director came with the preferred uh, costume uh, and um, set designers and, and the light designers. Sometimes it was different teams, Some, sometimes it was one person who did both costumes and set. Sometimes we had designers who just bluntly said, oh, I don't like hats, and then we knew that it wasn't going to be much for us. I hated that. And some of them were great. <laughs> We work with um, uh, fashion designers sometimes. I work with Christ Christian Lacroix, for instance, who is the most lovely person you can imagine and who loved to, to go through our drawers and, and take out all the, the ancients with feathers and ribbons and things and make things with that, even for, for the, the, the less important characters, just to, to have a, a, a beautiful background in play. Um, some designers came from the world of publicity, so they didn't know anything about constructing hats. So it was up to us to find the, the materials. And of course, that's always a problem because uh, when you're doing cost period pieces, um, you, you can't find, there are many materials you can't find anymore. We have problems with top hats, for instance, we have a large stock of uh, ancient top hats, but uh, head sizes have increased over the years. So many top hats work too small and there's only so much you can stretch without actually breaking them. Um, materials that we had in our drawers, when we want to reorder them, suddenly we were told, oh, no, no, that's not being uh, made anymore. We haven't had that for six months. Thought, oh, well, what are we going to do now? But that's something that's happening to us now. 
uh, we had a lot of old stocks. We used a lot of old hats. You never throw anything away as a milliner, but in the theater, this certainly counts. And if you have to dress characters that have not, that do have to look uh, as if they're not well-dressed or if, you know, uh, if they're poor, things shouldn't be new. So you use old felts and, and things. Uh, uh, you don't want them to look new. And then you can use all the old stock you have and give it a new life. So we did that. It was when we went into the cupboards, it was always very uh, dust. There was a lot of you know, very, very fine dust because all these things start to crumble. Uh, and we had hats everywhere. We, we lacked space as, as always, but uh, there were huge stocks. And um, sometimes we needed an authorization to, uh, to take apart something and, and use it again. You can't keep all the costumes you make, of course. We, we also had to, to, to look after the, the stocks and when it's full, it's full. So uh, yeah, well, we were continuously uh, sourcing materials and as to um, having an, 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 a design input, it, it depended on the designer. Some of them really wanted to have everything done exactly as they had drawn it, which is difficult because you're working for real people and it has to work on them. They're not a drawing and they have to be able to play with it. So then it was, you know, you really had to negotiate it. And some of them gave you a lot of space as long as the impression they wanted was good. I think the best designers are the ones who can see uh, that the, it's the, the idea that counts and that the design has to be adapted to suit the actual uh, man or woman who is going to wear the thing. If you, if you have to, to be, if the character has to be an elegant lady on stage and the, the, the actress who's playing it is not is not model size you will dress her the way she is elegant on stage so you can tweak and adapt things so i sometimes i took um uh had blocks i had at home uh and brought them to the theaters and said this might suit and this would be better and it's very nice when you can work together with uh, a designer so some of them i loved and some of them we absolutely loved because they were not flexible at all and didn't understand because it's not a protected title everybody can call themselves a designer well mostly we had good designers and it was fun to work with I didn't like the modern pieces as much because we didn't have much hats. So. <laughs> <laughs> and during your time there, did uh, was there a progression through when you entered the workroom um, up, up, up through the ranks of that theatre? Um, there, there wasn't any possibility. We were two milliners, so uh, I ended up being the eldest one, of course, and running the workshop. But still, we are, when you're two, you're, you're sort of partnering. I mean, it's not really. Uh, I wasn't anybody's boss or something. And that was one of the reasons that I didn't regret leaving because I, I would have been stuck there. I, I, I couldn't have uh, gone any further, not as a miller now. I should have done something else then. And uh, well, after 19 years, it was enough. Uh, <laughs> but it was also because there was little uh, possibility left outside for a, um, a, a job where I, <laughs> I got paid enough to raise a family because I had married and had three children, which I probably wouldn't have had if I had stayed on in Couture because of the irregular working hours, etc. Yeah. So it was a good stable job and when at times I felt a bit fed up, I told myself this is a good stable job. Uh, very or, or in an organized envi environment and it's very good to to be able I mean it's exceptional to be able to to live on with what you're doing and <laughs> sometimes it was really fun we we also did the the Christmas um, uh, play for the children once a year there was a Christmas play for children <laughs> and they used parts of uh, of the sets of other plays and we made sometimes we made little, little bits of costume and things and I remember saying to my colleagues we were I was making I think uh, cow's ears and she was making uh, pig's ears in, in, in colored fabric and said isn't this lovely I tell to my children I'm making cow's ears and I even get paid to do this so you know I shouldn't complain no it was oh, a right. it was a great environment and it's but it's an institution and um it's uh it has a lot of rules and uh, a, a very ancient history it's it's very interesting and the actors are fascinating people Actors are like normal people. There are nicer ones, and 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 some of them less. But they all have in common that they are very nervous when they have to go on stage, and uh, that you feel this building up uh, before a play is launched, and even afterwards, and that you have to deal with it. And some of them are are difficult to work with, and others are are just lovely. But it creates an atmosphere where you all work together in order to get this thing on the stage. And it's, uh, it's something 
when the play is over, it's gone. It, it only exists the moment that the play is on and the public is there and then afterwards it's gone. So it's fantastic to see all these means put together to do that because what happens is of course, it's, a, it's also an intellectual effort. The play is there to, well, if it's a comedy, it's there to make people laugh, but it, there's always a, a, a message you take home if it's, it's it's a good if it's well played you take home something to think about so this was a theater with um i can't remember how many hundreds of people were working there 400 i think if you count everybody the administration and all the technical service in order to do that to keep alive those uh words the texts i think that's fantastic it's magical France is a great country for culture that's amazing. And you mentioned you had some, you were taking blocks in. Were you making pieces at home for yourself or for other projects while you were still working in the theatre work? No, I didn't. I didn't have time. When I was working at Barté, I sometimes made hats for myself. But when I was working at theatre, I had a family by then. So I didn't have time. I didn't need to financially. And uh, there was just enough time to look after the children because I was working full time. Uh, I, I took one day off when I had three. Um, but really there wasn't any time left so <laughs> that was a bit frustrating sometimes but well there's only 24 hours in the day and by that time I was doing uh, union work as I had gotten interested in working conditions when working at Barthe I had joined a union and it was interesting because it made me uh, see how um, a business works of course the Comédie Française was a very large business uh, but there were lots of uh, uh, meetings and things to be decided, and that took time as well. But it was interesting for me because it, it, it made me um, it, it made me see how the other um, the, the other services work. We, we called it services, and you had all the technical services and the administration. And they all had their own rhythms and their own problems and things. Uh, the French tend to demonstrate a lot and, and go on strike quite a lot when they don't get what they want. It's not always a very adult way of doing things, so it was quite amazing. And of course, the people who could uh, block the play were the ones who had to raise the curtain. So uh, they were used to getting their way just by refusing to raise the curtain if, uh, yeah, well, so they could take everybody as a hostage. That was very peculiar. <laughs> and. Uh, I thought that it wasn't a very effective way <laughs> of moving <laughs> forward, especially as it meant that other um, services didn't get as much because they didn't have that power to block. So <laughs> there was a bit of, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, well, there were, there were frictions. And you see that if you don't look forward, uh, in the end, of course, everybody suffers because if you, if you play that trick too, too often, then there will come a moment when um, you don't get hurt anymore and um, you don't get money either. So it's very interesting when I look at French politics now, I think that they're, they're, they're still suffering from the same lack of um, uh, maturity. I mean, if everybody just stamps their feet and says, I, I want this and I, I want that, and you're not getting anywhere. So it's always very interesting to, to, to think how it works. So that was another education for me. It's never easy, but it was interesting to be part of it. Yeah. So no hat projects beside that. <laughs> and at the moment you're based in the Netherlands. What brought you back home, I guess? Uh, my husband, he's French and he works in a completely different field. He is an engineer in uh, aeronautics. So he worked at a very large French uh, company and he was a bit fed up about uh, the economical situation, which is never really quite good in France, unfortunately, and his lack of prospects and he wanted to go away. So I said, well, there's a lot of away, you know, the world's very large. And so he brushed up his English and said, well, the only thing I don't want is that we go to a country where I can't have a normal life with the children because I have friends and family uh, who work for Shell, for instance, and when you're sent out to um, Saudi Arabia or in Africa, it means quite often that the partner has to live a very sheltered life. And uh, that's nice for a couple of years, but not when your children grow up. Um, so my husband had the possibility of a job in um, 
the European Space Agency in the Netherlands, and the children had been raised in uh, speaking two languages. And of course, I couldn't say nay, no to the Netherlands. I said that, that's quite all right. So we moved in 2007. And by that time, I had been at the theater for 19 years, and I could uh, leave with a special arrangement that I don't think exists anymore, but it was one of those very French advantages where you uh, could, after, after, after at least 15 years and having three children, I don't know why, uh, you could leave with part of your retirement pension, a small oh, part. Wow. Even. Yes. So I said, okay, I can come away with a little bit of money. So yes, let's do that. Uh, the French have always been very concerned about people having enough children. Um, that's historical, it's too long to explain all that. So maybe that was part of it. But anyway, I had three children. I, I, I didn't do it on purpose, but I had three children. I'd been there for 19 years. So we came to the Netherlands and I decided uh, not to look for another job because I would never have the, the same job again. I, I said to my husband, I will never have this job again. Once we leave, you know, we sold our apartment in, in Paris. We will never be able to, to come back again. Um, so I took care of the home and the children because they have to make the transition from one country to another and uh, there was quite a lot to do we bought an, uh, an old house that had a lot of repairs to do um, and he he's quite a workaholic so uh, I had done a lot with my job and three children I said well now it's my turn uh, okay I look after everybody full-time and you do the working but of course after a couple of years when the children grew up I, I, I had brought all my stuff and my hat box and we had uh, a home large enough to have space for me I, because we don't live in a city now so that had always been sort of part of the plan in the back of my head and I it, I, it felt very frightening because I'm, I'm not from an entrepreneurial family I don't know how to visit anything so I I hoovered over the idea for a couple of years and then I said well if I if I'm not going to try I will regret it the day I die, I'll say, why, why didn't I try? So I'm going to do it. But of course, the Netherlands is not a hat country. There's not a market for it. But it was my opportunity to make the things I really wanted to make. And one of the good things is that there is internet now and that you can get in touch with the whole world. And that's lovely because I missed it a bit. When I was in France, the, the French are not, not that outgoing and they prefer everything to be in, in, in French as well. And of course, there are large of parts of the world where they don't speak speak French. So uh, I feel that it was like a, a breath of fresh air to be able to do what I wanted and to meet lots of people. That's lovely about the internet that you can get in touch with, like we are doing now. I, we, who could have imagined that? <laughs> that Opposite sides like, of the world. It <laughs> yeah, it is great, isn't it? So that so opened up a whole new world and. Uh, makes me very happy, I must say. That's wonderful. And after working in theatre, theatrical millinery for so long, how did you find moving back into fashion and couture millinery? Um, I love it. <laughs> because the, you, may, oh, you can make a hat. You can make a hat that really is about the hat. I mean, I have an idea. Uh, quite often it starts off with the material. And I don't have to think about anything else just trying to do what I have in my head and maybe not being satisfied the first time doing it again but I do it's it's just my idea and it doesn't have to to suit anybody else's set of ideas I, I won't have to play it down uh, I, I won't have to to take anything else in conservation that's lovely it's 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 another way of working then of course finding someone who wants to buy it is quite another thing but um, when you're working for the theatre, theatre, you're very much at service of the the, the cast and and and, and the, the whole project. And you're just a very tiny piece of that, and that's okay. But it's different. So I loved coming back to something where the hat can be the star of the show. <laughs> and in terms of uh, designing, as a young creative, you had a drive to create sculpture and create art after working for a designer who would probably present you a piece in a theater where you'd be handed a, a concept from a designer how did you work through finding your own aesthetic and the style you like to make was that something that came quite naturally or did that take some time i think it's 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 like everything i think 
it takes time if you don't realize it's it's only when I look back at my work now I said oh I made that oh dear <laughs> and it's also it very much depends on the materials but for instance when I started out um, cinema didn't exist and nowadays it's impossible to think of making hats without cinema so the materials change your way of working and you have to find out what you can do with them thermoplastics didn't exist we had a lot more um, uh, woven straws like um, uh, well, you still have Panamas, but we, we of course, we had the, the Paracisos, but the Paracisos, we had this, the Parabuntals, and there were a lot of other ones, what we called exotic straws that don't exist anymore. And you had to know how to work them. Each different straw was uh, more or less difficult to, to block. Uh, that has completely disappeared. You can uh, find uh, secondhand hats. Sometimes you can uh, rework them. But a lot of materials uh, just don't exist anymore uh, so you have to adapt as you go along and find your what you can do with them and I think that will always continue and sometimes I'm really sad I was very very sad when Spartry stopped being sold uh, that was really a big blow um, I remember it was around the same time when uh, Yves Saint Laurent stopped his workroom I mean it must have been around 2000 and I had the idea that was sort of the end of millinery because sparkly for me was essential we made our own uh, hat blocks with it and i thought how am i going to do without that and it felt like you know like when people tell you about the war that uh, there were less and less things and they had to find uh, replacements that were never as good as the real thing and it was uh, in clothing but also the, the food uh, when there wasn't any coffee and there wasn't any tea and there wasn't any flour anymore and they, they just had to make do i, I felt like and I sometimes feel like that. How, how are we going to, to continue? But of course, there are new materials and we, we do different things. But when you look at the quality of some straws now, oh gosh, <laughs> when you see, when you compare to what, what we used to have, yeah. we didn't realize at the time how precious it was. But of course, it was all handmade and nobody's going to, to spend time on doing that. It would cost a fortune. That, that, that's another point of, of millinery. It's difficult because when you look at the, the economic of the things, the, the, the ladies I worked with, uh, Jean Barthes, when they spoke about their youth, which was before the Second World War, when they started out, were quite young, they started at 14, 15 working in work rooms. They were paid almost nothing. They had their, their wages at the end of the week. Um, if they didn't like the, they had milliner anymore, they left and they found work somewhere else. But of course, they were paid very little. They didn't have any retirement pension. That was where they were still working when I was there. They were working a bit inside. Uh, we, we wouldn't want those conditions anymore. Lots of them were sort of halfway into pro prosecution because they were so badly paid. And nobody wants that anymore. But on the other hand, now that we have all sort of decent conditions, handwork is so expensive that it has outpriced itself. So that's a very difficult uh, problem. You can't solve it. You don't want to go back to the 1930s for working conditions, but the way it's going now, it will be so expensive that who's going to pay for it? So I have no solution for that. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it worries me sometimes, especially here in the Netherlands. We have no idea about handwork. Most handwork has uh, been removed to uh, low wage countries. There's a lot of upheaval now about uh, fast fashion and all that, but most people still me included we buy things we have no idea who made the stuff and and what wages they were paid and if they were fair wages probably not and if we had to pay fair wages as we consider uh, is is fair over here to be able to 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 pay for your bills when you're sick and to be able to have a, a retirement pension then the, more than half of the stuff we would never buy because we couldn't afford it so what world are we living in and on the other hand, I love hats. I keep making them, even though it's an economical impossibility. <laughs> but you can't just eliminate all the, the beauty and the joy in the world because of economics can. So it's, I don't know how to solve it. I don't know how other, other people cope with that. But it, it, uh, it's interesting and sometimes worrying at the same time. So you have to find your own voice in a way, your own shape voice. I don't know how you call that. And it's by practicing. I think it's like playing the piano or ballet dancing. It's every day. 
and then you get better and you don't realize while you're doing it what's happening to you it's only when you look back that you see the progress you've made and uh, i think uh, when you learn a new technique you start by copying what you've learned and then you progress and then you find your own way of doing it that's the interesting side there are quite often there are many different ways of doing things and it's good to know different things there's not one way that's better than another some people say oh you should never do this you should always do that i don't think so it it depends on the circumstances it depends on the price you want to sell your hat what you your clientele can afford sometimes you just have to make it easier and quicker and sometimes you can take hours to do something and um so every milliner has their own little tricks and the more you you meet people the more you learn and then you can adapt it into your own work you pick a little bit of, of this thing and a little bit of that and uh, gradually you find your own ways of working but i think it's only after a couple of years that you can see that you've de developed your own style maybe and it keeps evolving doesn't it for Always, everybody i think yes and so what style of hats are you making at the moment and where in the world do they get to go well, they, they, they quite often are colorful, rather feminine. Um, of course, when you work for a client, you work according to their wishes, you, you adapt to the circumstances. Uh, the nicest thing is that when you have made something and you get a, a, a message from someone that, oh, that's a nice hat. Uh, uh, do you still have that available? And most of them, they are available because they're, they're examples. And when I make uh, um, uh, a custom hat, it's always different. So then it's just because somebody fancies exactly the thing you've made, that, that's always a joy when they like your hat because of the material design special thing. So some of them end up in the United States and uh, some end up here just in the Netherlands for a wedding or uh, for an official uh, event. But the Netherlands, as I said, is not a great country for hats. So <laughs> some end up just on, on the heads of models for, for photo shoots and things. And, um, most people love hats, but very few are really there to wear them. The, the hats that really stand out. And most people, once they try, they realize that it transforms them. And that's lovely when you have a client, uh, for instance, when you get a mother of the bride, sometimes people are not very sure about themselves. They always wish that they were slimmer or better looking or younger or whatever, which of course is not the purpose of the day you want them to be happy and to be the best version of themselves and i think the best compliment is not oh you're wearing a great hat but oh you're looking great it should suit the person and enhance them and make them feel confident and good about themselves and when when you uh, realize that result i think my mission is accomplished so it depends very much on uh on the, when i'm just making a hat for me for pleasure then i don't know where it's going to end up but when i work for someone I will, you know, it's like in the theatre, you, you're at service of this person and then you, you try to add your little spark to give them that extra little bit that they're paying for in the end. And then when they're happy, you know that you've done the right thing. I think that's the thing for most people, yeah. Will you design a collection of hats or is it a constant flow of creations for you? Uh, I have designed a couple of collections. I try to do two collections a year, uh, but now I have a whole collection of hats. So I stopped designing collections all, also because I, I feel that a hat should not be something of just one season. If the hat is a well-made hat and it suits you, it should suit you for years. And uh, especially with the enormous fashion turnover, maybe we should uh, get rid a bit of the concept of a collection that is particularly for one year, for one season. Uh, same for clothing, well-made clothing, you're not going to throw it away because the season is over. I mean, I don't. And um, so I have a lot of hats and I, I try to do a photo shoot now and then. Uh, of course, this is expensive, uh, but you need good photos to show people what you can do. And uh, it's more a question of money. When I have enough money, I do a photo shoot. And uh, so I, it's the, I make hats because I have a material or because I see a color combination and I I don't really really know but I, 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 I say, oh I want to do this I want to do so I have a lot of projects that's sort of uh, laying around <laughs> waiting to be finished and sometimes there is a deadline or there is an occasion or, or something and then I make the hat and it may turn out better than I imagined or it may turn out different sometimes it's exactly what I imagined uh, doesn't mean I will sell it 
But if you don't have anything to show, you can't say to people, oh, I can, I, I can make everything you want. That doesn't help them. They have to be able to, to try hats on, to see what shape fits them, what it does for them. So you have to have yeah. different materials and shapes. And it doesn't have to be from this year. It can be from last year or the year before. It doesn't matter, I think. So I'm not doing collections anymore. And I've done a couple of to get started, yes. <laughs> and the customers that come to you, are they purchasing something that's already part of these this long-standing hat collection or is they generally asking for something that's a custom-made piece yes it will be custom-made because uh if they are paying the price i'm asking it's going to be custom-made because then it is because they really need something special otherwise they say it's lovely but it will be too expensive so yes it's custom-made and of course what they're paying for is also the service having something custom-made is is a luxury it's something you can get get quite used to because it's it's fantastic when it's custom made and um, custom made means made to suit the person that the size of course but also the face the, the the silhouette the personality the occasion the weather everything until they're happy and feeling good that's custom made and that's luxury so then of course it's always something specially tailored for them and when you're sourcing materials, are you looking to colour match exactly or uh, will you dye a material to match? Uh, I sometimes do dye, but I'm not a specialist. I only recently learned how to because in both places where I worked before, uh, the dyeing was done by someone else who was specialised in that. Um, uh, it's very nice, but it takes a lot of time. So if you want to do it for a client, uh, they have to be willing to pay for it because I don't think you can do it and not charge them for it because it really is special. It can, you can get it right in two hours, but it can also take a whole afternoon or longer. So yeah, th that's true. If you want to, to so true. Special so sometimes I do it. Uh, if 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 you take part in a competition, you can do it for yourself and and, and experiment and see what it what it works. Um, so, for instance, with cinema, of course, there are so many colors and you can layer them. And usually that's enough. And I like to have uh, color contrast. So uh, that I learned from the theater. If you, if you see something from far away, you need to have color contrast. Otherwise it will just become one sort of blur. So I like to, to, to combine colors. I mean, there are so many colors in the world, so why not use them? So sometimes you don't have to dye. You can just pick up different colors. Maybe if I was more of a specialist in dyeing, I would do it easy. But for instance, dyeing feathers is is it's magic. It's lovely, but you <laughs> you really have to set yourself to it and take take this afternoon to do that and then see how it works out. Some materials you don't know how it's going to work. I did um, uh, classes with uh, Bridget Bailey, cinema dyeing. It's fantastic. But there are so many things in millinery that are fantastic. You could specialize in every each one of them. I, I need another lifetime for that. So I do things as they come around. If, if, if I have an opportunity, and then I dive into it. And then, of course, you should do the same thing over and over again for a month to really specialize. Oh, there's never enough time for that. But along the way, you pick up a lot of different things. Yeah. And how is your studio set out now? Are you still working within a studio within your home? Yes, it's on the top floor of my house. It has lovely lighting. It's, uh, 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 it's overcrowding. The, the problem is when you pick up materials, sometimes you have the opportunity to get some vintage materials. And I always promise myself to, to not buy too much, but each time I buy things because I have an opportunity, I go home and I say, okay, well, I have to fit this in. So I have to redo the organization to fit it in. And then I say, oh, okay, now it fits. And then I come back with something else and then it doesn't fit anymore. And in between products, <laughs> I never have time for a good clean out. So it's horrible. My, my studio is now overflowing. And this summer I'm going to take time in between hats to, <laughs> to clear up. I have my three daughters. The eldest now has a job. Uh, so uh, if she decides to uh, find herself, she, she lived in England for a while, she's back now goes back to England and will be definitely back in the Netherlands. If she decides to, to move, then I think I'm going to confiscate her room. <laughs> that oh, it's shifting easier. further into the house. Yes, 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 yes. So my daughters are very uh, nice to me. They say, oh, it doesn't mind, mom. You can put hat boxes in there. It doesn't mind. <laughs> Don't mind. My husband is a little, well, 
<laughs> he is a very, very tidy person and he has to put up with me. But there's always more stuff. And, you know, as we never throw anything away and hat boxes never. tend to take up a lot of space. It's not easy to fit everything in. You can't <laughs> fold everything and put it in a drawer, can you? That's no. A hat's a very three-dimensional object to be storing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I had blocks. <laughs> I was going to ask you about your hat block collection. What's, what, what's your favourite? How have you collected them over the years? Oh, that's difficult. I did some, uh, I went to some sales in, in France. There is a, a, a house that's called Drouot and they sell masterpieces, but also ordinary stuff. And there was a sale of hat blocks once. And uh, I did my first bidding. That was very exciting. I didn't have a lot of money, of oh, course. So uh, how nerve wracking! So I, I bought hat blocks with a friend. We bought them together, and then sometimes people just uh, contacted you to say, "Oh, my, you know, my stepfather died, and he was a, a, a hatter, and he left some hat blocks. Would the theatre be interested?" And sometimes the theatre wasn't interested, but I was, and I bought them. Also because if people want to be paid, you know, um, without being officially paid, just because you want to to earn some money with it and not going through, um, not telling that to the, <laughs> to the tech services, which I can understand. Then of course the theater could buy and I could buy. And yeah. uh, so I, I have some lovely French fifties uh, hat blocks, you know, those tiny little hats with a lot of sort of draped, movements in them that were worn at the back of the head, half hats that are too small for my hat because I have a too large hat, go very well on smaller uh, faces. Oh, they're quite cute. And um, later on, I bought uh, lots of hat blocks at uh, Moss Brown, okay, Moss Brown, because they have such a fantastic collection. And of course, there are a lot more milliners in Great Britain. so. They have a, a very up-to-date collection. I bought some uh, hat blocks here in the Netherlands, um, but they don't exist anymore. So I have blocks from everywhere. And as you go along, you start to get more choosy because sometimes uh, hat blocks are offered on the second-hand market. But if you have a lot already, you you start to to, to choose a little bit uh, more specifically things that you've never seen before that you'd like to, to buy. And uh, there is an exchange when we, within the, the Dutch Hat Association, we have uh, one hat day a year and people can bring stuff they want to sell that can be books or materials. And sometimes people sell blocks and then you can pick up blocks. So, you know, it goes around and around. And uh, I, I love that. I like the idea of blocks uh, always ending up at somebody else's uh, work. And sometimes you look at blocks and you see that they've been used. You know, you, you try to imagine whose hands have, have been working on this block, what kind of hats have, have been made on them. Uh, if they come from the, the, the 50s or the 40s, you know, that's, if they could speak, that would be lovely. And you mentioned there about the Dutch Hat Association, you are um, part of the board there. How did you first become involved with uh, that organization? I can't quite remember. I must have heard about it. And then as I had my, um, um, union worker passed. I said, well, if there is an, an, an organization, whether it's an association or a union or a club or whatever, who does something for my profession, I should go and see what they're doing and, and, and join them. You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the others. You're doing it for, for, your, for, the, for the branch. And so um, I went to the annual meeting and I asked a lot of questions, I think, because I always do that. And <laughs> they asked me to join the board because, of course, they, as with all associations, they're, they're always needing people. And yes. it was lovely because um, when you work alone, you, you need colleagues and other people who, who like what you do. And I, was, I had always been used to working with other people, very much working in, in, in a team. So I missed yes. that. And, and then there was Ellie. She came to interview me. Uh, because there is a column in the in, in uh, headlines about new members, and she came to yes. interview me, and um, and I, I talked a lot. Well, as I'm the stories I'm telling you now, and she she said to me, "Oh, that's interesting. You should write them up." And I said, "Oh yeah, well, have a time, blah blah blah." 
And then when she was gone, I said, well, maybe I should, because when I was, especially when I was working at Bastet, sometimes I said to myself, nobody's going to believe this, I have to write it. <laughs> and I thought, well, I have this opportunity, why shouldn't I do that? So I started writing those stories for Head Signs, and after a while they got published. And that's lovely to, to do on the side, because it's, um, it's also a way of talking to people, but through writing and knowing that, that, that people will read it. So it's uh, the association, it's, it's a community where you can exchange, build your network and uh, meet like-minded people. And it's uh, also nice to, to, to work to, to, to get hats more visible. So it's a great environment. And what is an upcoming project that you're looking forward to working on? Well, tomorrow I have uh, the annual herring party. Well, if you're not Dutch, you won't know what that is, but uh, I think you know what it is. I know what this is, but you should share with those who might not know what the <laughs> herring party is. It's a hoot of a time. <laughs> yeah, it's a Dutch custom uh, where you um, where you eat the, the new herring. So that's the, 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 the freshly, uh, the, 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 the herring that has come to maturity from this spring. And it used to be uh, Dutch herring, of course, but nowadays it's uh, fished in the, the waters of, uh, uh, of Scandinavia. Um, but the tradition was that boats were bringing it in and then the boats had little flags on them and everybody celebrated the new herring. And uh, there are parties, mostly it's business people who invite the clients and customers or it's entrepreneurs among themselves. And you have this herring and whether you like it or not you eat the herring and the thing is to, to you can eat it with uh, with a little fork and then quite uh, ladylike but you can also take it by the tail that's the traditional way you, you take it by the tail you dip it in onions and then you put your head back and, and then you, you you just slip it in and it's it's just uh, it's a big thing here and i don't know why but um it was tradition to dress up for it so i am a member of the local um, entrepreneurs club here in my uh, town, Oostgeest, and I, st I started wearing a hat to, uh, to this herring party, and I'm the only one, of course, and all the ladies who like the hat, but they don't dare to wear hats themselves, so I uh, always go there with a, a, a large hat uh, to defend my, uh, my branch, and uh, I have a picture taken of me <laughs> in a very <laughs> fancy hat, uh, uh, eating a herring uh, by the tail. So that's my tomorrow project. I still have to finish the dress I'm going to wear. And then uh, I have always have a project with the Hat Association. Uh, the last one is just over. That was our um, uh, memory competition. We just finished that. So, <laughs> And uh, now we're going to work on the, the annual Hat Day that will be this autumn. So it's a very much ongoing thing. And then I have... Uh, Product was uh, for, for, for clients, of course, that are um, slowly going on on the side. And uh... that sounds so exciting and so many exciting projects to be up. I can't wait to see this year's herring photo. Um, we'll <laughs> have to watch your social media <laughs> to see that one. It's been so lovely to talk hats with you. Thank you so much for joining me for today's podcast. Thank you very much, Nora. Thank you for listening to this Millinery Info episode with Vise. Thank you to our amazing podcast sponsors for their support of this series. Judith M. Millinery Supply House, Hat Academy, Best Western Apollo Bay Motel and Apartments, House of Adorn, Hatter's Millinery Supplies, Louise McDonald Milliner, Be Unique Millinery, Lifted Millinery, Hats by Leco, Millinery Australia and Hat Mags. You can find a link to each of these businesses in our show notes. That's either in your podcast app or through our website. I'm your host, Lauren Ritchie. Thank you so much for joining me today for this episode, and I look forward to talking hats with you again soon.